podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, where we demystify what happens behind the therapy room door. And I'm really looking forward to this episode because we're going to look at group therapy versus individual therapy. So I'm Jackie Jones and I'm here with Bob Cook, who's who's a expert at this. I've never done group therapy, Bob, so this is this is new to me. I'm gonna learn something. Okay, so so much to talk about with this whole subject, but um let's make a start on this. So I've been running individual uh sessions or working clinically with the individuals for 37 years and running uh groups for 30 years wow so i stopped working with groups four or five years ago i i used to run them two or three times a week um so i've done a lot of work in groups and a lot of work individually so i can talk about the difference between the two of them i've been in groups i've had group therapy i've just not facilitated it myself Oh, well, you'll be able to talk. Because yeah. you you've had individual work and group work, so you yeah. can talk about what you see as the difference. As the client, yeah. 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 yeah, so that's okay. So I'm not quite sure where to start the podcast, but um, I can tell you a little bit about how group therapy works. Um, so, again, it will, de- it will depend really on people's might have different thoughts to me but i can just tell you how i i've done that i was trained in transaction analysis psychotherapy i was trained in integrative psychotherapy so the major modality of the group was from a ta perspective and basically i would have a group from six to eight people two hours the group would run and it'd be every week so two hours, six to eight people every week. And they would need to have seen me individually for three to six months at least. So I've got a sense of attachment with them. Yeah. And also we've worked out a contract on what they're going to work on in the group. So you see them first to get an attachment going. Usually at least three to six months or more. And then uh, you get a contract for the group therapy and what they want to work for in the group. Usually, I said a minimum of three to six months, but quite often for a lot longer. So usually, and it's all time because sometimes people have been in therapy before and they specifically want to come for group therapy. But for the sake of this word I keep using, usually uh, people come and have individual therapy and then progress, if you like, into a group. It isn't they go into a group and then go to individual therapy. They go to individual therapy and then they progress to a group. So people who went into my groups would have seen me indiv- in individually for quite a while before going into a group. Yeah. I can understand why, why that happens. Yeah, because one of the things that's really important is that the person going into the group has um, a secure base with the group facilitator, i.e. me in this case. Yeah. Of course, if they haven't got that, they may not be able to deal with the, you know, the fluctuations or the difficulties that may occur in the group um, they need a secure base with me, and also they need to have worked out what they want to do in the group contractually before they go into um, a group. They have to have worked out individually what they want from the group, and they'll only know that um, through work with me. So would you say what it would be a different thing they contract for the group therapy as they do individual? You, they wouldn't just have the same 
sort of issues in individual and then go in a group and not really recontract or anything? Well, uh, let's sort of have a pathway into a group. So somebody comes, how it usually is, people come, or someone comes to therapy, let's say they come with depression, anxiety, and they start individual therapy with me. And they contract on working with depression or working with the anxiety, whatever it is. Yeah. And then we start working on that. And then as we go on, um, we might, as we start to heal some of the depression, um, come to a conclusion that they might benefit more or they continue their work or yeah. integrate their work uh, if they join a group to cement the process. Yes. Yeah. I can I can see why why it would be a good thing to move from individual into a group with particular things. Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't work the other way around. No. You don't group group to individual. Uh, group therapy is an excellent format for practicing what you've individually learned. Yeah. Before you go and practice it in real life. So you can go and practice some of the new behaviours with a small amount of uh, people who are going to be very supportive with you before you actually integrate it in real life, or you can see it as a stepping stone yeah. into integrating these new behaviours. Yeah. So for the therapists, do they need extra training to facilitate a group as to well, very good question. Um, I think they need to have at least been in group therapy themselves or model them on how group therapy works. Yeah. Because if you've not at least had an experience of being in a group, then you have no model to work from. Yeah. Now, makes that makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Ha yeah. Okay. And, and sometimes that isn't always the case. I was thinking of two particular very experienced therapists who worked for six, seven years individually and almost by synchronicity, and they don't know each other, um, and I'm their supervisor, both of them said, and they don't live in the United Kingdom, they both of them said, we are going to start a group up. Now, they haven't had any extra group training on this, um, except they've probably done a module in their training four years ago. Uh, and both the same, both people from the same institute, actually, neither of them had any experience of being in a group. And as I said in the supervision with them, this will probably hold you back, mm -hmm. even though I can help you with... Um, how you want to run this group. Yeah. So in my opinion, if you could get some training somewhere, even if it's only some CPD training on running groups, it would be useful. Otherwise, I'll help you. Uh, we'll... Yeah. Which is, the, which is what happened eventually with both of them. Yeah. Because the, the dynamics are completely different, I would imagine, group to individual. Well, again, it depends on how you plan to run this group. So if you're running a what we would call process oriented group. And that means that for the two hours, you would be dealing with what comes out of the process. OK, yeah. So you can say, OK, we've got two hours and simply over to you. Yeah. And then you would deal with co what comes out of the process in a pro pro what is called a process oriented group. Yeah. yeah. Now that's would mean you being involved. That would mean you being highly participative yourself and you would do the therapy or teach of the process, process oriented group. Now, I think, I personally think that takes quite a lot of um, 
I think somebody needs a model of that type of training, and it would be good if they have some training. Yeah. There's an in that group. There's another style of group which we'll just call hybrid therapy group, uh, or another way of putting this is um, doing individual therapy in a group. Yes. So in other words, somebody comes to the group. Sorry, uh, say six people in the group, and they would contract for what they want to do or work on in the group and the therapist would be part of that bilateral contract and then they would work individually on that in the group yeah so we've got six people usually what happens is that uh, at least two or three people perhaps four would work one week and then other people would work next week if they hadn't worked the week before um, so if you're the style therapist where you're going to work with the individual in the group and you've been an individual psychotherapist yourself, that doesn't take that much more training. Yeah, I, I would hazard a guess that that was the type of group that I was in, the hybrid, where it was individual therapy within a group, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So. And, in, and in transaction analysis world, and I know you come from that, most therapy groups tend to be working uh, individually in the group style. Yeah. And I don't think that needs that much particular specialised training because A, most trainees have been in that type of group themselves and B, they probably got some of that training in the group and C, their supervisor can help them with that. And four, their experience of working clinically individually um, holds them in great stead yeah so it does depend what type of group you, you're going to run therapeutically i think to answer your question about specialized training yeah but that does that is that clear yes yeah yeah I didn't realize I thought group therapy was just group therapy I didn't really realize that there was kind of different ways of, of doing it oh yes there's many different ways there's working within the process like I've just said see that yeah. one I, I've got this fantasy about that I kind of imagine that being like it was in the 70s where people sat around in a room discussing you know su subjects and just general sharing of experiences and things like that is that is that what that kind of therapy is group therapy uh yes and no so what you're describing could be called was called in the 70s and early 80s an encounter group okay where we you would go and simply encounter what happened in the group and that uh the, there'd be there'd still be a leader that would help deal with the so-called encounters but there wouldn't be contracts it wouldn't be uh every week for you know six months you wouldn't have had to be an individual therapy to go in that type of group you'd simply go and encounter the experience okay i thought that those types of groups were very unprotective and um i wouldn't recommend them okay it's kind of like you know those old pictures that you see of like Eric Byrne and all those when when you know in the early days of of things where they were all sitting around smoking in comfy chairs just I don't know what happened in those rooms but that that's kind of what my fantasy is of early group therapy. Well early early group therapy if you're going to bring Eric Byrne into this I think was partly educative therapy. Okay. He would teach about the parent, adult, child. He would teach about games. He would teach about rackets. He'd teach about script. And it was highly cognitive. Right. There was not much emotional work going on in those early group, burn groups you're talking about. Now, if you're talking about early Gestalt groups rather than TA groups, where they would look at emotions and they'd do a lot of rechilding, where they look at... Um, you know, the, how the past affects the present, but more from an emotional point of view, there wouldn't be so much ed educative therapy and it wouldn't be so cognitive. Yeah. Um, I think I think that what 
what we're talking about here is how the style of how you would run a group. Um, and I think a lot of the TA groups particularly are individual therapy in a group style without dealing with the processes and dynamics of what happens in the group. Okay. So for example, if you had the process group style and it started off with somebody saying, you know, well, actually I feel quite depressed. However, when I come to this group, I often feel even more depressed because I don't feel anybody really listens to me about how hard it is for me and how isolated I feel. Okay, so the group facilitator might say, oh, I can really hear what you're saying. And Jack, what do you think about what John's just said? Oh, well, I don't really agree with that, but sometimes I switch off because I find you quite boring. I don't know if that's the depression. And then the facilitator said, oh, and what do you feel back in response to that, Jack? So it's dealing with what's happening in the group. Yeah. Because somebody else might come in then and say, I feel pretty angry the way you responded to Jack Dave. Have you got no empathy? And then the facilitator would, so you'd be processing the group so it's kind of like now that you've you've explained it th that's what we did at the end of the weekend's training was kind of group process where we all got together and discussed what had gone on over the weekend or whatever so, so you processed what was happening in the group yeah all oh, right so i've i've experienced that then in, yeah that's different from yeah. a therapy group yes oh i've done both then yeah you go me <laughs> both. however um i think you need more training to run a process style group than you do individual in a therapy in a group style because you need to be able to handle the what i would call the uh, group's dynamics yeah. as well it's much more of i think a, a more challenging system i can see that yeah <laughs> yeah oh. now both those styles i think uh have their merits and disadvantages 34 years of running groups, I always had the group of, um, you know, working individually with people in a group. So come to individual therapy with me, have contracts and take them back into groups. It wouldn't be time ended. In other words, it wouldn't be just for six weeks, it would be for six years. Yeah. But people usually stayed in groups, maybe a, a year or so. They'd, they'd work through their contract, uh, do the healing they need to do and leave. Some people might stay three, in three or four years. People might leave after six months. There was no time orientation to it. Would you, would you see people individual and in the group concurrently at the same time? Well, that's a really interesting question. I'll answer that and say no. Okay. And then I'll go on to say why. And then I'll go on to say some of the disadvantages and advantages of both of those. So... One of the problems about seeing somebody individually and keeping hold of them, so they, in other words, they may have an individual session on the Friday and come to their group session on the Monday. One of the advantages of that is knows about the issue that the client has individually and they can work off the back of that and then they can take it into the group. And so, and there's more group time and more psychological time for the client. One really big disadvantage though is that the people in the group may um, have fantasies about what the therapist, i.e. the special person, is doing with the client individually because they don't have access to that. Right. So that can encourage what I'm going to call psychological splitting. Yeah. Where there's a splitting process going on uh, between what is uh, the person deals with individually, which never gets back to what's being held in the group. Now, you could have an open contract. So what's being dealt with individually is then shared in the group. Yes. So that takes away perhaps the se secrets part of all this lot, but it doesn't take away necessarily the splitting part where um people in the group may feel uh, they're not special and this other person is special yeah and so, i can see how that would you play out yeah so personally people didn't now the disadvantage against that is is the person who's 
see me for individual style and wants to also see me continue their individual work and being in the group may feel abandoned by me if I say you've got to be in a group. Uh, so we have, it's a very delicate uh, set of negotiations. Yeah, which again, I suppose, goes back to what you started off saying that you need to have been seeing them, you know, for a minimum of three to six months. So that transition isn't an abandonment or seen as an abandonment by you if they did move into a group. Yes, that's correct. But at but or stroke and they might, might not find that transition easily or even though they've decided in, to do it in the adult for advantageous reasons and might not be able easily to let go of me yeah. and, want, yeah. and want to have individual therapy and have group therapy at the same time. Yes. Yes, and with certain clients, I could see that that is something that they would want to do, extra bob <laughs> during the week. Yeah. yeah, so that's true. Now, part of this title of this podcast is, you know, you put it down as individual versus group therapy. And, you know, there's, the way I see group therapy, as I said, is a developmental process on from individual therapy for them to practice their new behaviours in groups. However, what you might say is one of the disadvantages of group therapy is things like um, people might uh, withdraw in groups, they may go underground in groups, they might feel people with withdrawn uh, natures like schizoids for example might find groups very difficult they may feel humiliated and ashamed in groups they may uh, recreate their past dysfunctional system in a group we could go on yeah yeah uh, people in groups might find it particularly challenging and therefore maybe there's a discussion for individual therapy being the more appropriate um yeah method rather than having them ever go in a group. Yeah. So um, I didn't insist everybody goes in the groups at all. It, if I felt that people would get a lot out of being in groups in terms of vicarious learning, mutual learning, support, et cetera, et cetera, then I may suggest it. But for some people, I think they might find sh lots of things in the transference showing me uh, all sorts of things I can think about. Groups might be inappropriate style of therapy or a step too far. Yeah. Yeah. I found it really easy to hide in the group, mm. which I suppose at the time was something I saw as a positive. I could go and I was learning vicariously. I took an awful lot in because being on the receiving end of it, I was quite surprised how much I kind of got through osmosis, if you will, listening to somebody else's therapy session. I also got something from that, even though it wasn't, you know, mm. me undergoing it, if that makes sense. But I did find it easier to hide in the group. Yeah. Absolutely. And also, um, that may or may not have been good for you, but there's other issues which people would find hard in groups and therefore perhaps it's a really good reason why they never go in groups. Uh, uh, you know, shame, humiliation, playing out things. I mean, I could say it's very important for those very reasons to be in a group. However, um, I didn't push people into groups. It was more if they decided it wasn't from them, it wasn't from them. Yes, yeah. Because I suppose, you know, the dynamics of the group need to be considered as well that if if you there's a new member coming into the group you know how that's going to impact on the group as a whole and then if that member leaves that that's also going to impact on the group so there's, there's a lot of group process going on mm. a lot of the time I would have thought that's right and another advantage for individual therapy Many clients might say, well, we have a whole hour to ourselves. We're in groups. We might have 20 minutes yeah. or so, two weeks or whatever it is. But in individual therapy, we get a whole hour. We get we get all your attention. Yeah. You know, um, so there's some advantages of individual therapy. Some people like their own groups 
because of all the things I've talked. And also, interestingly enough, um, money may come into it because yeah. groups are cheaper than individual therapy. Yeah. So people had different reasons to go into group therapy. And as I said, I might encourage people, but if they don't want to go, that's their prerogative and their choice because it's a contractual process. Yeah. Yeah, it's not just like meeting up once a week and chatting and shooting the breeze. There's still a contractual process to it. There's still, yeah. Yeah, and it will be a therapy contract, so it'll be far away from what you just said, but I know what you meant. Um, okay. It wouldn't be at all seen in the line you've just said it, but it, it would be very exclusively therapeutic. Um, it, there wouldn't be any pastiming allowed. Yeah. Uh, depends how you run the group. I mean, you might want to call... Well, I had people sharing for five minutes good news that they've actually... Some good news has happened to them during the week so you might want to call that past time i actually call it called it very therapeutic by the way but i think groups can be very challenging for people and that's maybe a good enough reason to do it but for some other people it, it might be excruciatingly difficult and in some ways it could even be re-traumatizing so i think therapists need to think very carefully about who they invite into groups and why they invite people into groups and what the clients get out of it being in groups. Yeah. Because I suppose as, as the therapist, there's an awful lot to think about because, you know, if you're working in a particular area, you don't necessarily know whether those people might know each other mm. before they enter the group, which could be an issue. Do you know what I mean? There's there's a lot of things to consider i suppose if you're going to run a group this i suggest you have if you've had not been in a group before or stroke and here you have some supervision sessions yeah or you actually start running groups because how you start the group who you have in the group the composition of the group the contracts of the group the pitfalls of groups they are i think they need to be discussed before you start your venturing, if you like, into the world of being a group therapist. Yeah, because I, I, I know some therapists who, you know, because of the workload and, you know, I suppose the need to see more clients then having a group potentially, you know, frees up some of the therapist time. If you've got six clients in a group, and you're working for two hours, that means that you can potentially see more people in your week because you're not seeing six people individually, which is kind of like a full day's work. That's interesting. For practical reasons, I agree with you. Many therapists say that. I think it's the wrong reason to run a group. Me too. I, I was just putting that out there. <laughs> That's yeah, you know, no, the reason are... why most therapists I know start groups is purely for that reason. I'm not saying that that isn't a reason, but I think that you need to have a passion and I think for running groups. And also, I do believe there needs to be some training, even if you do it in supervision before you start the group. Yeah. I mean, I understand the practical reasons. I understand the economic reasons. But if you just have those as the reasons in themselves, then I think you may lose some passion for group therapy yeah so for if for anybody of the listeners so it's about you know clients that have been in individual therapy for three to six months before you even you know consider them going into groups look at the type of group that you would want to run whether that's a process group or whether that's the hybrid as individual therapy within a group yeah. look at accessing extra training yeah or taking it to your supervisor prior to that and uh, discuss with the client why you're suggesting they go in a group yeah and go with the client yeah if they say don't want to be in a group then it's really important that you don't force them into a group because you want to start the group off or or the reasons you just said there uh, economically or practically 
I think the, 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 the bit we need to think about here is service of the client and the clinical reasons behind individual group therapy yeah yeah rather than the monetary or practical reasons behind it and i can see that the client does get benefits from it what is there a minimum and a maximum number that you would you know what 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 constitutes a group <laughs> well, i never went above eight okay that was simply on time reasons okay so would and you pass three as a group therapy session well you know what's the lower end of that because i suppose two is like couple therapy well the issues that get talked about endlessly in groups is competitiveness competitiveness over time and money so if you're going to run a group of eight people you i i suggest and this is what i did was say we're not likely to get through more than three or four a week yeah. in terms of having exclusive time with me yeah so the contract will be that you will get priority the following week if you haven't worked the week before yeah the one and secondly an understanding that the vicarious nature of a group probably means that you're actually doing therapy all the time anyway yeah, I, I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. But they need talking about. Yes. So back to your other question. Anything past two is a group. Okay. If you talk about couples therapy, it's a duo. Yeah. So you wouldn't really start a group, in my opinion, less than five, four or five people. Okay. People drop out. Yeah. And, you, and really, you do need to start. If I was suggesting that we started a group, then you, I would suggest they start with at least a minimum of six. But you're right, anybody over two would be designated as a group. Yeah. So that's, that's brilliant, Bob. Thank you. And, you know, following on from that conversation of duos or couples, um, we're going to talk about couples therapy versus individual in the next podcast. Yes, certainly are. That's an interesting subject. Again, I could talk forever about, but I look forward to that. Okie doke. See you in the next one. Okay, bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.